Hi, and welcome to another edition of Expert Talk. I'm Glenn Birkins, founder and publisher of Q-City Metro. And we're back again to talk about home ownership. And again, we have as our guest, David Havlick. David is a uh, mortgage banker with South State Bank. Uh, David, uh, this is our second time talking about home ownership broadly. We know the importance of home ownership. Home ownership is one of the fastest and most sure ways to accumulate uh, wealth. Uh, can you talk just uh, just a little bit uh, about other reasons why home ownership might be important? Uh, you know, home ownership statistically um, is proven to provide uh, their, the, the, the homeowner as well as those who live there, you know, generally safer communities. Um, there, there's a, 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 com, a connection with children being able to do better in school when they have a stable household and, and, and part of that is home ownership, right? Um, so it, it is a very, it helps create state, more stable communities. Um, and, and that translates into better communities for everybody. And to say nothing about just the joy of owning your own home and the satisfaction of owning a home and saying, uh, you know, this is, you know, this is, this is mine. Yep, that's exactly right. You know, there's nothing like coming home. You know, we were just talking about being on vacation and, and how much fun it is, but there is nothing like coming home. Uh, to your own bed, your own house, something that you own, and uh, something that you work hard for and you invest in. Uh, and there's a lot to be said for that. So the last time we talked about uh, the importance of establishing and maintaining good credit. Today, we're going to talk about another vital aspect of uh, home ownership, and that is getting that all-important down payment. Uh, it seems like a basic question, but what is a what is a down payment and why is it important? So uh, a down payment is, uh, for lack of a better term, the buyers, the homeowners skin in the game, right? That is the amount of money that the borrower is going to put up as their equity portion into their their financial commitment into the home process, home purchase itself. Um, there's a, th there are a multitude of products uh, with uh, mo a multitude of down payment options available, um, but, but mo not all products require a down payment, but the large majority do require some form of down payment, uh, the, the homeowner's commitment to their investment. And we're going to talk about some of those different products later, some that may not require a down payment. I remember, um, I remember when I bought my first house, my wife and I, uh, you had to have 20%. Uh, is that, is that still the case? No. Um, in, in fact, I, I might say that most people, uh, especially first time buyers, you know, are, are not putting down 20%. Um, that adage kind of stems from uh, a time when that was effectively required uh, back, we'll say back in the day, um, you know, mortgages. <laughs> back when Glenn evolved. was young. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, you know, that, that's when mortgages were, were different. There were not as many products um housing you know has evolved the lending has evolved uh the amount of risk banks are willing to take has evolved um and, and of course overall housing has become more expensive um you know, over the years right especially in the last you know maybe five or six years housing is you know the depreciation of homes has really taken off across the country so you know, not all products uh, require that 20%. And, 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 you know, some folks that may have that 20% may choose to do something else with that money, right? Um, so when you're looking at down payment options and different products, you know, your mortgage is really a financial tool. So what you're attempting to do and what I'm attempting to do as a mortgage banker is try to help you, the buyer, 
figure out what is the best way for you to utilize your money in conjunction with the bank's money. And how does that fit into maybe your overarching financial goals uh, as a homeowner? Are banks willing to negotiate that down payment percentage or do they typically have a uh, set requirement? Uh, so the requirement for down payment will be product specific. Uh, it is also driven by the type of property you're buying. In, in other words, uh, maybe not the type of property, but maybe the, the occupancy of the property that you're purchasing. For example, uh, as if you're buying a primary residence, generally speaking, you know, not notwithstanding the, the zero down programs that we'll talk about, but as a primary, generally your minimum down payment is about three and a half percent for FHA, three percent for conventional, um, and and then it you know it goes up from there. If you're purchasing a second home or a vacation home, your minimum down payment there is going to be ten percent. If you're purchasing an investment property, uh, your minimum down payment is going to be 15%. Um, and and rel relative to second home and investment, you know, those are the minimum down payments. Rates tend to get better with the higher level of down payment on those type of properties. So the more you can put down, the better rate you generally speaking the better rate you're going to get the uh, lower interest rate to a degree right um also your down payment could serve as what we would call in our business a compensating factor right and and what that means is you know we know that last time we talked about credit right um there's an other component to getting a mortgage which is your debt to income ratio right? All of, and your down payment, right? Your loan to value. All of these things work in tandem to help you get approved for the best terms. So there may be situations where somebody may not have the very best credit, but they do have a significant m amount of money to put down. Um, and that may compensate and help you get a little bit better of a rate than if you maybe didn't have the best credit and didn't have a lot for down payment, right? It might be, you might come out with a higher rate at that point. Um, whereas if you've got a larger down payment and maybe your credit needs some improvement, that may compensate for that and, uh, and, and help balance that out, if you will. Let's talk about, let's talk about uh, mortgage insurance, if you will, because uh, even back in the day when, as you say, when I bought my first house, uh, you didn't always have to have 20% down. But if you didn't, a bank would require you to have, uh, I, I think I think they called it private mortgage insurance or something like that. Is that, is that still the case? Largely, yes. Um, largely, yes. And that's where that 20% down number stems from. Right. That's that's kind of what the uh, overall industry standard has been for decades. Um, however, there are now a multitude of products at, you know, generally speaking, and there are outliers here, but generally speaking, uh, and especially at South State, that uh, at 10 percent down, there are either ways to get really creative with how you structure that private mortgage insurance or PMI. Um, or you may not have it all together. Um, whereas, you know, in, in the past, when you had much more of a, uh, I might call a standardized set of mortgage products, um, those options really weren't available. Um, okay, so let's talk about the down payment itself. And once again, I'm going to use myself as an example. Uh, when I got our when, when, when we got our first home, uh, the bank uh, required uh, bank records, all kinds of documents. They wanted to be sure that we had actually saved that down payment. They wanted to see, uh, they wanted to see uh, where that money came from. Has that, has that changed in any way? 
No, um, that that is still uh, you know really the standard. Um, the the bank and, and especially uh, with the passage of uh, like the Dodd Frank Act, which which passed shortly yeah. after the financial crisis in 2008, because um, for some time we got away from that, right, a, a, as an industry, um, and and it, it it didn't end well, right. So um, what has happened is you know, the pendulum has kind of swung back to a place where we've got to understand uh, that the money is there, but we also need to know where it came from. If, for example, you know, you send me your bank statements and you have, um, uh, you have large deposits in your, in your, we'll say, savings account, right? Um, and that large deposit might be considered anything greater than 50% of your monthly gross income. Um, the bank is going to be required to ask you to show us where those funds came from. Uh, and that is largely driven not because the bank thinks you're doing something not above board. Um, there are some, some pretty stringent guidelines from an underwriting perspective that are regulatory that are put forth by the government that we have to document where these funds came from. It, it really has to do with uh, anti-money laundering things. Um, not that I've ever even run across anybody doing that, and I've been doing this 15, 16 years, um, but it, that's what the requirements are. And it, sometimes it can feel invasive, um, but that, that is kind of an industry standard that, that we all have to adhere to. Are there legitimate and illegitimate places where that money can come from? Must I, must that money be all mine? Could it be a gift? Could it, could it be a loan? Uh, what are the, what are the rules around getting that down payment? Yep. So, so each product has specific requirements. Um, now I will say if you're buying an investment property, gift funds are not allowed. The, the, if you're doing an investment property, the funds have to come specifically from you. Uh, now, if you're purchasing a primary residence or a second home, gift funds are an acceptable form of down payment. Uh, there's a couple different ways that, that you can transfer those funds and, and that we document that, but that is 100% uh, a, a viable form of down payment. Typically, the bank is going to want to understand your relationship with that individual who's gifting you the money. Uh, typically, they are required to be a family member of some sort or a spouse or perhaps an in-law or something like that, um, and, and, but that, that is okay. Um, what are, what, if you're taking a loan for your down payment, uh, in some cases, that's acceptable you would have to be able to document that the loan is secured by an asset. For example, you could not pull, we'll say a cash advance on a MasterCard and, and use that as a down payment. You could refinance your car per se, right? Because that loan is tied to the collateral, which is the vehicle, and you could use those. If you owned another home and you had an equity line on that home, you could use those funds for a down payment. You could also borrow from a 401k or something like that. All of those would be acceptable forms of a down payment because that loan is secured to an asset. It's not just kind of an unsecured loan, if that makes sense. Yes. Uh, let's go back to that gift. Uh, let's suppose a... Uh potential home buyer comes in and says, I got a gift from uh, my parents, my in-laws, my brother, what have you. Uh, is any proof or documentation required for that? Yes, yes. So th there's two ways that, that those funds can be documented. In general, from a... Um, ease of processing perspective, might I say, the, the way that you'd want to try to transfer those funds would be from that individual who's gifting the money 
directly to the closing attorney at closing. Um, the other way that you could do that, and what happens is during the underwriting process, the buyer and the donor, in this case, we'll just say mom, mom and, and the, the, the buyer sign what's called a gift letter. And the gift letter displays or denotes the relationship between the two individuals, the amount of money that's being gifted, and the account number where that gift is coming from. And if those funds are transferred at closing from mom to the closing attorney, all we do is we ask the closing attorney to certify and confirm that they've received those funds, and we match that account number up with the account number on the gift. Um, now, if, for example, the homeowner is, you know, way ahead of the game, and they know that they're going to be out buying a house, and mom or dad ha has agreed to, you know, gift them $50,000, we'll just say, and, and, and they have already received that prior to closing, right, maybe even prior to applying for a mortgage the bank is going to obtain their bank statements and they're going to see this large deposit. And we're going to say, where did this come from? And then they'll sign a gift letter, the same gift letter that we just talked about. And then what will happen is we're going to have to get documentation from the donor of the funds coming out of their account into the account. Uh, and we match that up and that's how we account for that. That's how we reconcile that. Okay. Uh, you mentioned, uh, or at least you uh, alluded to, the financial crisis back in, uh, I guess, 2007, 2008. Uh, to a large degree, uh, that was uh, that was that was mortgage driven. Bad mortgages that that went mm -hmm. bad. Mortgages that went bad. A lot of those mortgages were zero down. People were buying properties that they uh, that they simply. Uh, could not afford. What uh, what safeguards are in place now to ensure that that type of thing does not happen again? So great question. Uh, you know, really, I think there's there's two safeguards that that are really in place. Um, the the first one is there is now requirement of so part of that Dodd Frank Act. Uh, that, that kind of came through was also, there was a component of that called ATR. And what that means is ability to repay. So during that and leading up to that crisis, there were lots of different, the best way I might put it is exotic loan types, right? Where banks and or mortgage lenders, uh, mortgage companies were just, creating products to get more and more people to qualify, to keep the, the music going, if you will. And part of that was these programs that were called stated income uh, and stated asset programs. And that is really a program where if, if, you have, um, if you have a purchase price and you're going to say, okay, I am a teacher and, and I make $100,000 or $150,000 uh, with, with, and you meet a certain credit score requirement, the, the bank or, or lender would not actually verify your income via pay stubs or tax returns or anything like that, right? Um, and, and so you would, you would have these people that would just state a number just so that they could qualify. That was then. Um, that was then. Now, there are stringent requirements and documentation requirements on being able to qualify and income calculations. We have to, and this is across the industry, we have to verify your income. Um, and in addition to that, there are pretty hard and fast, what we would call debt to income ratio requirements. Um, you know, in general, 43 to 45% is about the max. There are some other products that will 
will allow you to go higher up to 50%. Um, but, you know, think about if you had somebody just stating their income, the debt to income ratio wouldn't matter because they would just state an income that would be high enough to qualify. David, you read uh, now my, you're, you're limited. David, you read my mind about that uh, uh, debt to debt to income. Can you can you talk a little bit more about about that? There's also something called uh, loan to value. Uh, what are these what are these ratios and why are they important? Yeah, so lo we'll go with loan to value first. Um, your loan to value is kind of just that, right? What is your loan amount as a percentage of the value of the home or the sales price of the home? Um, so for example, if you're putting 10% down on a property to purchase, your loan to value would be 90%. So you're borrowing 90% of the value or the sale price of that home. Um, your debt to income ratio is a percentage that is X number of your gross qualifying monthly income. So to make the math easy, if you make $10,000 a month, we'll say, um, then you can have in general, and this again, this is product specific, but we'll say 43% maximum debt to income ratio. That means you'd be able to carry up to $4,300 a month in debt. And, and what that means is that would have to include your new mortgage payment, property taxes, homeowners insurance, HOA dues, if those are applicable, plus any minimum payments on credit cards, student loans, car payments, et cetera. All of that would have to be equal to or less than $4,300 if you had that qualifying income of, we'll say, $10,000 a month. Um, so that is, that is the, what the debt to income ratio is. Uh, and there's, you know, there are different ways in which that's calculated depending upon how you create your income. And and down payment affects all of that naturally. It does. It does, right? So all of these things, your loan to value, uh, which of course is is part, you know, in, in conjunction with your down payment, your credit score, your debt to income ratio, all these items work in tandem. Um, to, to get you to a place where, you know, you, you're qualifying and, and not, not that you're only just qualifying, but that you're qualifying for the product that makes the most financial sense for you. And that's part of my job as a mortgage banker is to help you kind of work through all that. David, let's go back to uh, getting that down payment uh, and uh, sources that, that a bank might deem legitimate versus illegitimate. Uh, one of the questions, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the questions that I have might in, uh, involve uh, a business account. Let's say that a business owner wants to buy a home and has and, and has a business account. Would money in that business account be considered a legitimate uh, source for down payment? It could be. Um, the answer... <laughs> The, the, the standard mortgage answer always is it depends. Um, it depends on the type of business you run, your operating expenses, uh, and then, of course, how much you have in that business account. Um, so the underwriter will take into consideration all of those items. For example, if you own a company that will say has 10 employees, and you have fifty, seventy-five, eighty thousand dollars in your bank account, business bank account, and you need to pull out sixty thousand dollars to for your down payment. The underwriter is going to have some concerns with that, right? Uh, because the question is going to be: if you remove these funds from this account, do you have the operating capital to continue to run your business? to generate the income that we're using from that business to qualify you to repay this mortgage, right? So 
the generally what the underwriter is going to look at might be the last six months of your business bank statements to get a pretty good idea of what your deposits look like, what are your withdrawals, what are your operating expenses look like, um, so that they can kind of make an assessment on will this distribution from this business entity negatively impact your ability to repay the loan. Now, on the other side, if you have $250,000 in your bank account, your business account, and you need 10, well, that's a different story, um, right? It, it's not, it, it's unlikely to materially impact the operation of your business and your ability to repay the loan. So let's talk about gifts from the seller. Let's suppose that I wanted to buy your house and you were really motivated to sell, but I don't have uh, sufficient down payment. Could you contribute to my down payment as the, as the seller? The seller or, or any other interested party in the transaction will say your real estate agent, uh, your closing attorney, they could not contribute to your actual down payment. Your down payment has to come from you as the individual, as the buyer. That has to be your skin in the game. Um, of course, that can come from a gift, but not a specific, not an interested party in the transaction. Um, the seller could, however, and or your realtor could, however, contribute to your closing costs, right? Um, so that may lessen the amount of cash that you're required to bring up front to the closing table, uh, but you would still be required based on whichever product you're qualifying for um, to, to contribute the minimum amount for that product down payment wise out of your funds or we'll say gift funds. What if the house I'm looking to buy appraises for more than the amount I'm looking to borrow? Could that be applied? Could that be applied to my down payment? It could not. Um, because the bank is only going to lend you a percentage of the appraised value or the sales price, the lower of the two. So if, if it comes in higher, which we've seen a lot of over the last few years, um, that's great. It's equity in, in your back pocket, you're making a, a good investment, um, but we can't necessarily apply that to the loan in the form of, of a down payment to meet that equity requirement. Okay. So if someone were uh, coming into South State today saying, I want to buy a house, what advice would you give that person? Generally speaking, that person's never owned a home, might be a first time home buyer. Uh, where do you start? Well, you know, I always, I'm always happy when buyers come to the bank first. Um, you know, you really want to start with the money first before you get out into the marketplace and you start looking at properties that you may fall in love with. And then you find out the numbers don't really jive with where you feel comfortable financially. Um, so, it's always a good exercise to start with the money, which product, where you feel comfortable most. You know, I find in general, most people qualify for more than they're comfortable with, and that's good. Um, you know, nobody, you, you don't want to be, the, the term is house poor, right? You don't want to wake up in your house, love your house, but hate it because you got to pay so much. Um, so you want to start with the bank. You want to start with what products are best for you. And if there's an opportunity for us to put a plan together, let's say maybe you're not quite there yet, but we're going to put you on track, whether it be from a credit perspective, or maybe, you know, we, we pull some levers on how to restructure your debts or your finances or something like that to get you on that track. That's where you, that's where you want to start. You've alluded several times to the various products, and I and I and I don't want you to let me forget that. But uh, before we get to that, uh, 
let's talk about pre-approval. Is there is there such a thing as pre-approval? Can I come in and say I'm looking to buy a house, uh, and you pre-approve me for a certain amount so that when I go out and talk to a seller or a real estate agent, I'm already pre-approved. Yeah, pre-approval, especially in today's market, uh, is is paramount, right? Um, the, 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 it, it's still, even though the market is shifting, it is still very much a seller's market. And when you're ready to make an offer, um, you want to have that pre-approval signed, sealed, and delivered. You want to make sure that uh, the bank has vetted your income, your assets, your credit. And while it's not necessarily a full commitment to lend, uh, it is uh, as about as good as it gets. Um, to, to, to confirm to you as the buyer, your real estate agent, and the seller that you're a very serious uh, contender for this home and you are qualified for the loan and for the offer that you're making on this home. Um, it has been extremely aggressive in the marketplace over the past, we'll say, five years o overall. Uh, more so in the last two to three, but, you know, a, a lot of real estate agents are going to require a pre-approval in order to get you out and start looking at homes so that they know that, you know, they're not wasting your time uh, as a, their time as a real estate agent, but they're also not wasting your time as a buyer showing you something that you might fall in love with. And, and then you end up either stretching really far um, and maybe putting yourself in a bad position down the line financially, uh, where maybe that's not the best option for you. Would the bank give me a letter or some document stating that I'm pre-approved for a certain amount? How does how does that work? Yeah, absolutely. So so once we've you know run the credit, income, assets, we've looked at all that, we will issue you a letter, uh, and there are multiple ways to do it. Some uh, buyers and real estate agents like to have specific letters for a specific offer that they're wanting to make, right? So a buyer may may be approved for, you know, 350, but they find a house for 275 they love. Um, and they don't necessarily want to show all their cards per se. So, you know, we might give them a letter that shows what their max will be uh, based on where they're comfortable. Uh, and then we may also issue a letter specific to the offer that they're making, um, for, from a negotiation uh, leverage perspective. Okay, let's talk about some of those products. <clears throat> Excuse me, let's talk about some of those products. What are some of the more popular products uh, offered by South State? So we've got, gosh, our product menu is, is pretty extensive. Um, maybe we'll start with uh, the, the standard kind of conventional Fannie Mae loans. These are your you, kind of your plain Jane vanilla, maybe 30 year, 15 year, 20 year fixed rate mortgages. Um, we've also got your FHA products, which tend to be your, a little bit more of your first time home buyer products. They're not necessarily for that specifically and only, but generally speaking and historically, that has been a product that's been very popular with your first time buyers. Um, you, you've also got VA loans for our, our uh, wonderful veterans, right? Veterans can qualify up to 100% financing where the VA will guarantee that loan. Um, and there are certain requirements for that. Uh, we've also got USDA loans. USDA is a product that is also a 100% or no down payment product. That product is driven the qualification by that for that product is driven by the geographic location of the property tending to be in a rural area uh, to kind of promote ownership home ownership out in the rural parts of you know the country the county um, and then outside of that south state we have our own uh, suite of what we call portfolio products uh, portfolio products are products where, for lack of a better term, the bank, we are lending our own money out of our own piggy bank. We're doing these loan products 
on our own books. We are going to keep them in house. And as such, that affords us, in many cases, a little bit more latitude and flexibility from an underwriting perspective, um, because essentially the bank is the investor on the product. We don't, not that we make up our own rules, we still have very much standard requirements, but because it is our own money, it is our own risk, we have in some cases the ability to do things that other banks you know, may not do. For example, um, we have one uh, really popular product called Buyer's Advantage. Uh, it is a 100% uh, pro- finance program, no down payment, 30-year fix with no PMI. Um, and, and that is a very, very popular product um, that, uh, you know, has, has helped with the increase in home prices. That's really helped some people get into some homes that may not have ordinarily been able to uh, from a financial perspective. What we would be the requirements have, for something like that with a, for a, a zero down mortgage? So there, there are, from a requirements perspective, uh, South State requires a minimum of a 640 credit score on that program. Um, you do not have to be a first-time buyer, but you cannot own any other residential real estate at the time of closing. So you could, for example, sell your existing home to buy a new home, uh, but you could not, per se, sell your existing home, buy a new home, and have four rental condos in Myrtle Beach type of thing. Um, so, so it would have to be your only residential piece of real estate. Uh, there are three ways to qualify, uh, one in which there are income restrictions. So you would be able to use the program if you make less than, I believe it's $62,000 per year, anywhere in Mecklenburg County and surrounding. If you make more than that, you could still use the program. However, the location of the property, it must be located in a majority minority census tract or a low to moderate income census tract. And we use a government census data tool on a website to give us the data for that specific address for that property. Uh, And and really the gear or, or the goal of that product is really to help promote home ownership and lend to all communities that we serve, you know, in and in and around our, our bank footprint. Mortgage rates were low for a long time. As we all know, the uh, interest rates are down rising as the uh, uh, Federal Reserve boosts interest rates to try to cool down the economy. Uh, what should what should prospective buyers be thinking about in terms of uh, buying? So I think that you should be, you know, in the Southeast, in, in our region, if you will, um, it's largely expected that with rates rising, the market will begin to cool and plateau. Uh, but we all believe, for the most part, that home prices will continue to rise. Uh, not necessarily at the breakneck clip that they've been doing, right, over the last few years, you know, over the last few years, we've, we've had double digit appreciation year over year, which is astounding. Uh, the, the economists and, and mortgage bankers association, we believe that, and, and industry professionals, we believe that we're probably going to begin to return to a little bit of some normalcy on the appreciation front. Um, and, and that's going to be you know, maybe a three to five to 7% appreciation annually. Um, we, we expect rates to continue to rise for some time uh, to kind of pull back on some of this inflation. But inevitably, the Federal Reserve will have to begin to pull rates back down at a certain point. Um, that's all going to be data driven and, and kind of based on inflation data, CPI numbers, GDP data. Um, but overall, you know, what happens as well is rent will continue to rise because we have an inventory shortage, you know, at least definitely in the Carolinas and the greater surrounding. So we, we think that 
home prices will continue to rise, although not at the same trajectory, not at the same clip, but they're probably still going to keep going up. So, uh, you know, it might be a good, it, it's still, historically rates are still overall low, right? Uh, we were spoiled for a, over a decade with unbelievably low interest rates. Um, unlikely that we'll see that again, that low, right? Um, but if you look in the history, we'll say the last 50 years, um, interest rates where they are today are, you know, still at or below average. I think, uh, I think the rate was 10% on my, on my first house. Uh, yep. where are they now roughly? So your conventional rates are, are sitting around 5.3, five and a half, somewhere in that ballpark at, at zero points. Uh, your jumbo rates are probably a little bit lower, you know, right around 4.8 or 5. Uh, a jumbo mortgage is any loan amount above $648,000 uh, in, in our region where, where we are here in this market. Um, so your, your jumbo rates are, are a little bit better uh, than, than your conforming or, or conventional rates. So what I'm hearing in, uh, in wrapping up is that if I'm looking to buy a house, uh, it probably would be a good idea to go in and sit down with a mortgage banker and have a have a conversation before I get too far into the process. You, yes, you, you definitely want to. That's where you want to start, right? Come in, sit down with us. Uh, we'll you know guide you through the process. If if now is the right time, off we go. If you know we need to put a plan in place to get you where you need to go into a home for you and your family, that's what we're gonna do. But definitely you wanna come in, sit down, uh, schedule a, a virtual meeting like this or, or even a conference call and, uh, and we'll get the ball rolling. Okay, well, thank you, David, for another good conversation about uh, home ownership. And thank you to South State Bank for, uh, for sponsoring Expert Talk. I'm Glenn Birkins, uh, founder and publisher of Q City Metro. Have a good day. Thank you, Glenn. Good to be with you. Thank you.